Greetings all, FerrariMan601 here. Welcome back to another 118th scale model car review of this, the 1996 Williams FW18 as driven by Damon Hill in the 1996 Formula One season. This model comes to us from Mini Champs in their World Champions series. This model was not produced in the period, rather, at least according to the copyright on the box, this one was produced in 2016. So Mini Champs going back, this is more recent production now, reproducing some of the World Championship winning Formula One cars. I know that at very least they have also done the McLaren MP413, that was Mika Hakkinen's championship winner from 1998. I also happen to have that one, perhaps we'll take a look at that at a later date. But here, 1996, Williams, Damon Hill. This car was absolutely dominant. It won the Drivers' and Constructors' World Championship. It was designed by Patrick Head and Adrian Newey, that mid-90s Williams Brain Trust bringing their team from strength to strength. They'd had some difficulties in the previous two seasons, of course, Benetton being incredibly dominant in 1995, and then 1994, the whole team having to pull together again after the tragic loss of Ayrton Senna, but they won the Constructors' Championship in 1994. Damon Hill very narrowly missing out on the 1994 driver's title in very controversial circumstances. The car's immediate predecessor was the revolutionary FW17. That car in its own right basically set the standard for what Formula One design would become all the way up to the end of the 2000s. The chassis on this car, carbon fiber and epoxy honeycomb composite structure, just as we still see today, front and rear suspension, double wishbone push rod, those push rods actuating torsion bars via bell cranks, the engine in this car, yes, it is the absolutely wonderful V10, three liters displacement, it's by Renault, the specification on that was the RS8 or the RS8B, depending on the particular time in the season that we're talking about. V10, 3 liters displacement, mid-mounted, longitudinally mounted, and, of course, naturally aspirated. The transmission was a Williams-designed 6-speed semi-automatic paddle actuation. Fuel provided by ELF and tires, as we can see, provided by Goodyear. The competition history, illustrious. A driver's championship, a constructor's championship, driven by Hill and Villeneuve, made its debut in the 1996 Australian Grand Prix. Out of 16 races in 1996, it took 12 wins, 12 pole positions, and 11 fastest laps. It was also arguably, actually, nope, not arguably at all, the most reliable car of 1996, and that played no small part in Williams' absolute dominance that year, winning 12 out of 16 races contested. That is some dominance, and, uh, well, we're seeing dominance now in F1, but this was dominance back in 1996, and a much-deserved world championship for Damon Hill. Let's take a little bit of a closer look at this car, talk about it, nerd out a bit, and of course, talk about all of the little details that we can find on this wonderful model by Minichamps. It's not so often anymore that we consider Williams to be among the elite of the Formula One teams who have managed to win multiple Constructors' Championships. However, that is the pedigree that Williams still have to offer to us. It has been a very lean period for the team since their last Constructors' Championship all the way back now in 1997. Yeah, we think about McLaren, for example, winning their last Constructors' Championship in 1998. Williams, one further year removed from being at the top of the world. But they do continue to be with us all the way now in 2019. They continue to be a privateer outfit and they continue to persevere through all of the rough patches that they have gone through. Of course, we also associate Williams very much with Ayrton Senna in 1994. Of course, we lost him, and you just might be able to notice on the nose of this car there is a little tribute to Ayrton Senna. All Williams cars since 1994 have worn some sort of inconspicuous tribute to their Brazilian champion driver. Unfortunately, he was unable to win any world championships with Williams. Unlike his successor and teammate even, Damon Hill, who we see here in the FW18. 1996 was Damon Hill's year, finally, after what arguably should have been his world championship in 1994, Damon Hill was unable 
to capitalize on any chassis advantages that Williams might have had in 1995, Michael Schumacher taking back-to-back -back driver's championships and Benetton winning the constructor's championship in 1995. However, Damon Hill leading the team into 1996, Michael Schumacher had gone off to Ferrari along with some several uh, Benetton team personnel from the team management side as well as on the technical side, Ross Braun also following Schumacher to Ferrari. This meant that Schumacher was not going to be the same threat that he had been for the past two seasons. So Damon Hill and one very inconspicuous and obscure Canadian called Jacques Villeneuve also joined the team alongside Hill to drive the FW18. And the championship was basically Damon Hill's and Jacques Villeneuve's for the taking. Schumacher going to Ferrari. The Ferrari was a vastly inferior car relative to the FW18. The Ferrari had big time reliability concerns, whereas the FW18 was incredibly reliable. It was far and away the most reliable car of the season, and according to my reference here, over the entire course of the season, it completed 1,778 out of a possible 2,028 laps. So that's an amazing reliability record, and that of course played no small part in ultimately winning the Constructors' Championship for Williams, as well as, of course, the very famous and long overdue driver's championship for one Damon Hill in that very famous to this day sequence crossing the line at Suzuka at the end of 1996 Damon Hill winning the world championship and Murray Walker very famously saying that he's got to stop because he's got a lump in his throat of course Damon Hill being the first British world champion since Nigel Mansell. That was a long time coming for the Brits, who of course are crazy fans of motorsport, Formula One notwithstanding. So the world championship went back to Britain courtesy of Damon Hill, who of course was also driving a little bit on the wings of a legacy. Of course, his father, Graham Hill, was a world champion. Unfortunately, he was taken from us far too soon in an aircraft accident. But that helmet that you see Damon Hill wearing here on the model, that is the same design that Graham Hill, his father, also wore. And I believe that uh, happened to be the insignia of a rowing club somewhere. And the name of it is eluding me at the moment, but the helmet had personal significance to Damon Hill and as well to his father, Graham. In terms of what we see here on the model, well, it's a mini champs car, which means that you're going to get yourself a pretty good bang for your buck. We do not have any opening features on this model, but what we do have is very nice bodywork, very nice paint, and very nice sponsorship graphics to the extent that they're allowed to reproduce them. Of course, this car was very famous running in its Rothmans tobacco livery. Unfortunately, we do not have that featured here. That's simply trade and dress regulations catering to an international market. However, we do have the little barcoding there where you would expect to see the Rothmans name, and of course the Rothmans colors are still very much a part of this livery. Basically, the entire car was styled to look like a pack of cigarettes. And of course, Frank Williams being the, bi the businessman and privateer that he was, he was not at all shy in terms of changing his livery, if need be, in order to appease sponsors. Because Formula One in the 90s, and especially going through the mid-2000s, it was an all-out spending arms race and the tobacco companies were the biggest players in that arms race. And of course, Williams being a front-running team in this era, yep, that meant you had to have tobacco sponsors on the car. Unfortunately, we don't really seem to have that amount of easy money available in Formula One, or even most of the time in motorsport in general to this day. And we can argue to the ends of the earth as to whether or not tobacco sponsorship was actually good for the sport, I would argue that it was because it allowed top drivers to go to top teams and it meant that the top teams would win and even the minnow teams from time to time could win some races. Yes, I'm talking about guys like Ligier and Jordan. Yeah, saw that in the 90s too. But be that as it may, Mini Champs doing a great job on this livery and generally they're doing a great job with the overall proportions and smaller details on this car. Zooming in close as the midline of the car rotates past us. You can see the barge board detail there. Relative to what we see now in 2019, we've got ourselves a rather simplistic looking design, but still you can see the family resemblance between something like this and even a modern Formula One car. Yeah, things are different now in terms of the front and rear wings, their overall locations, their overall designs and relative sizes, 
but you've got a front wing mounted down low where you'd expect it to be, mounted on pylons as we still see from some of the teams, and you've got a rear wing mounted very far back, relatively high and relatively narrow, not nearly as narrow or high as we would see later on at the uh, 2000s, at the end of the 2000s, 2009, with those very high and narrow, grotesque looking rear wings, but again, you can still identify this quite readily as a Formula One car. And this was something that was very interesting about this overall era of design. Going from about 1995, when the regulations were drastically overhauled, largely in response to the events of Imola 1994, and all the way up to 2008, the cars more or less followed a geometric progression in terms of the overall design. They were all evolutionary designs. Teams did not do anything truly groundbreaking in this era in the macrocosmic sense of car design. Rather, they took what worked from one year and they applied it to the next year's car and it was just a series of small adjustments that took us through the end of the 90s and basically all the way up to the end of the 2000s as well. So you can still notice the family resemblance here today in 2019 on this car from 1996, but you could really notice it on a car from 2007-2008 and then looking at this very same car. They were really cast out of the same mold in most respects. Toward the end of the 2000s and starting actually in 1998, we had grooved tires rather than slick tires. After 1997, the cars went from being two meters wide as this one would have been to 1.8 meters wide. Again, this was in an attempt to cut cornering speeds because there was some concern, much like there was in the ground effect era in the late 70s and early 80s that the cornering speeds were exceeding the limits of circuits to arrest these cars safely. So the cars were made narrower and the tires made a whole lot less effective by cutting big old grooves into them to limit the contact patch. But still, now in 2019, the cars are the same width. We've got slick tires. Modern cars are quite a bit longer than this because these cars, unlike their modern counterparts, had to refuel. But again, you can still quite readily identify this as a Formula One car. Getting in a bit closer on this now, we've stopped the rotation. Take a look here at the front wing on this car. Now think about what we see in 2019. The front wings are a little bit wider now and they are a whole lot more complicated. This, well, <laughs> you've got the wing running through this section here and you've got flaps on the uh, rear surfaces of the wing on this point each side and that's it. You don't have these big cascade bridge elements coming up from the end fences. You don't have uh, these big strakes running under the wing trying to create outwash and funnel the air this way across the front of the car. None of that is here. This is a single element wing. It's generating all of its downforce off of the main plane and the main plane only because there's nothing else on this car. That's it. Just this upturn segment and that is it. And of course you could look at the uh, FW19 from 1997 and see effectively the same design on that wing as well. Again, the idea was just to generate downforce, and this was the simplest, most cost-effective way that they figured out to do that, so that's what they did. Even here on this wing, in this section, for example, underneath the end fences, you don't see the uh, flow modifiers there, the little vortex generators via the inverted U-channels. It was just not necessary. They didn't do it. They were happy with the performance margins that they had, so they went with it. You can also see, unlike on the modern cars, we have got this very high nose assembly here and the wing mounted on very long pylons, relatively speaking. The wing still pretty much at the same height relative to the road as it is today, but the noses are much higher in this era. And again, uh, the reason for that was they were trying to funnel air underneath the front nose of the car so that they can start to work it with the under tray down as it sort of uh, starts to bifurcate around the car moving rearward. We don't have the high noses anymore because the FIA say that it's too dangerous, even though there was never an incident where a nose actually came into the cockpit of another car, but that's a rant for another day. So we've got these low noses nowadays, which are incredibly ugly and incredibly inefficient, unlike this 25-ish year old design, which uh, still to this day, more effective than the front ends on the modern Formula One cars. Getting a little bit more of an angle now on our front suspension. This will be familiar to everyone. Double wishbone pushrod 
front suspension on this car and double wishbone push rod rear suspension on this car as well. There are your wishbones and then here is your push rod running up at this angle here. Again, the Formula One suspensions on the front end anyway are still working in exactly this manner in 2019. And again, it seems to be the most efficient and effective way of creating a suspension on an open wheeled race car because we see even IndyCar and uh, of course Formula 2, Formula 3, Formula 4, basically any open wheeled series today running double wishbone push rod suspension on their front end anyway. Modern Formula 1 has gone for the pull rod geometry on the rear, unlike this one with a push rod, but again, some old habits die hard and the double wishbone push rod suspension now all the way back in 1996, still seeing it in 2019 pretty cool all that. Also on the front end of the monocoque here you can see that we've got some decent detail going on. We have got this uh, antenna aerial right up here. That's nice as it uh, starts to slope up to the proper uh, section of the monocoque here. Front nose assembly ends right here and you can see the shut line where the nose attaches to the front of the chassis and then that goes all the way back to the cockpit area where of course we have got our driver situated. You can also get a little bit of a look at the flow modifier here uh, integrating with a roll hoop on the front of the monocoque just ahead of the cockpit. This actually looks somewhat reminiscent of the advanced frontal protection device, the AFP fin that IndyCar added to their chassis uh, midway through 2019. And again, it's just a fin and it sits basically in that position on the uh, Delara IR18. The idea behind that is uh, to add a little bit of roll protection, but for the most part to deflect any large debris coming in toward the cockpit area. This is before IndyCar goes for the aero screen idea starting in 2020 but on the Williams here this little fin it uh, is part of the roll structure of course uh, the roll protection on a Formula One car uh, a little bit different from how it is in 2019 in this era you have the roll hoop which integrated with the air snorkel up here and then you had this front piece as well so uh, when the driver would roll the car and you hope that this wouldn't happen but effectively you draw an imaginary hypotenuse between the top of the snorkel down to that section on the chassis so as long as the driver's head is below all of that as you can see it uh, pretty much would be that is good and that would certify him to go racing Along the side of the car now, here is our front wing end fence there. And uh, again, you can see very much in contrast to 2019, it's just a flat section of bodywork. There's nothing else there. A little bit of a spillover uh, on the very low side. There's a little bit of a sill down there, but it's just flat. It's not curved. There are no winglets, no nothing. Just a lot of flat billboard space for your sponsors. So there you go. Also on the pylons that are supporting the front wing, you can see right there there is our little tribute to Ayrton Senna and again every Williams since 1994 has worn on some place a little tribute there to Ayrton Senna there on the front end of the car there we go there's our tire Goodyear Eagle Goodyear a very successful manufacturer in Formula One I think they uh, still lead in all out Grand Prix victories even now in 2019 but there you go Goodyear tires on this car uh, you can also see that we have got the OZ wheels there, nice uh, spoke detail in there, and of course it's all black on black, so a little bit difficult for the contrast, but we do have a uh, brake rotor and brake caliper detail in there, and you might just be able to see the gold of the caliper peeking out through there. Very cool. As we move across toward the cockpit area, you can see that we have got barge boards going on. There we go with the Sanyo branding on them. You can see where the uh, upper and lower wishbones on the front suspension pass through the barge boards. Very cool. Uh, again, uh, very similar in overall philosophy to other barge board assemblies that we saw uh, after this, as well as even to present day, still very large and now very elaborate barge board designs on Formula One cars. So much simpler in this era, but the same idea still prevails. Again, as air comes in across the front end of the car, you want to start to get it turned around so that it starts to entrain itself to the side of the bodywork and feed the diffuser toward the rear, as well as you uh, split it ahead of that so you get some of it into the radiators which of course is pretty important if you don't want your engine to go bang after only a few hundred meters. Very cool. 
cockpit sills here, uh, you'll notice that they're significantly higher than they were on some previous year's cars. And uh, part of this was because there were revised uh, driver protection measures specifically uh, to be put in place in the cockpit starting in 1996. The Ferrari F310 uh, definitely had probably the most apparent uh, manifestation of this. But the Williams also raising the cockpit sill there just so that in the event of a lateral impact, the driver's head uh, has something soft to, to run into rather than uh, the driver's chin area and his neck going directly into the side of the cockpit. Remember, no Hans device in this era, so anything that was going to be there to try and constrain the driver's lateral movement, particularly in his head and neck, was something quite welcome and uh, very good in terms of trying to improve the safety aspect of all of this. Of course, uh, 1995 as well, and the real impetus for really wanting to, to fast track the cockpit safety upgrades was Mika Hakkinen's big accident at Adelaide at the end of 1995, and uh, he very nearly died in that incident. And again, all of that could well have been protected with some better cockpit safety measures. Of course, ultimately with the Hans device, that problem would be truly solved, but this, uh, again, was another stopgap measure, just trying to improve things with the technology that existed at the time. Moving rearward on the car, rearward of the cockpit, now we get into the side pod detail. Look at how chunky this is. Uh, compared to the modern side pods, of course, modern cars, uh, they've got V6 engines, this thing has a V10, so it's physically a larger engine, there are more cylinders there, it's longer, it's a little bit wider, uh, that means, of course, they've got different packaging considerations, not only for the engine, but for the radiators and overall cooling for that engine as well. But really chunky side pods nowadays, they're basically shrink-wrapped, and you have all kinds of free floor space in this section of the car. Not the case in 1996, but for its time, very, very svelte, I must say. Moving farther arrears, you can see now we've got some free floor space for some air to feed the top side of the diffuser. We've got our rear wheel and tire assembly, rear suspension behind that, of course, and we have these very interesting little wing extensions. This piece, this vein with the number 5 on it going all the way back to the rear wing itself, this is all one piece. And of course there's another one on the right side of the car. All one piece. Uh, this idea, again, was uh, basically the same as other little winglets that we would see pop up along the side pods on these cars in years to follow. But again, you're just trying to get a little bit more downforce around the midline of the car through here a little bit more stability, move the center of pressure a little bit forward so that the car is not too tail happy or too nose happy. So in other words, the thing is more stable, easier to drive, and more consistent with its overall performance. Now the rear zone on FW18. Here's where we start to have some pretty radical departures from a modern car. Of course, we have got our rear wing up here. Here is our main plane and down here is our beam wing. We don't really see beam wings too often anymore in Formula One, but there it was. It was a very big thing all the way up really uh, until really 2009 is when we uh, started to get away from the beam wing idea. We still saw them, but they weren't quite as prevalent. But in this era, there they were. The other big departure in this this is our rear rain light. However, that's all it is. It's just a light. There is no rear crash structure to speak of on this car, at least not in the sense that we would now be accustomed to seeing one. Rather than having that, we just have our pylons, which support the rear wing down here, and then immediately below, we get right into the diffuser, which is actually the rearmost section of bodywork on this car. Nowadays, we are used to seeing diffusers terminate immediately underneath the rear sill of the car, if not just immediately underneath the rear wing, but here, this center section of the diffuser, this huge tunnel, is actually the rear of the car. So in other words, if you were going to be impacting this, the first thing you would hit is the diffuser. And of course, this is not any sort of structural member of the car. It's not designed to be bearing weight or anything like that. So it's by no means a rear crash structure. So perhaps nowadays, modern eyes would say, uh, safety, uh, what is it, doesn't exist. Why did you allow these cars to race? You've got to remember, this is the time we were in. This was real engineering. This was simply trying to go as fast as possible within the confines of the technical regulations. And Williams did that better than anybody else in this era. To either side of the main tunnel, you will see that we have got these two smaller areas of the diffuser, therefore I'd call this a triple decker really, because you've got the reference plane down here, and then 
tunnel number one, tunnel number two, and then big tunnel number three down the center. So there you go, triple decker diffuser. What you don't see on this car too readily though are exhaust outlets. I'm led to believe that this area here and this area here are supposed to be exhaust outlets for the V10 engine. Of course, remember it's a V block, so we're going to have at least one pipe coming out from either side of the engine there. Don't really see them. They were not topside exhaust in this era. Nobody had run a topside exhaust really up to this point in F1. Ferrari were the ones who came up with the periscope exhaust, which uh, would vent out the top of the bodywork here, but that didn't come until 1998. So everybody running exhaust outlets either through uh, this section here, about midline, almost level with where you expect the bottom of the engine to be, or actually blowing the diffuser, uh, such as Adrian Newey on the McLarens, he did that, and also on cars previous to this, in the previous generation from 1989 going up to 1994, we saw a lot of exhaust blown diffusers exiting either through this central uh, tunnel or off to the sides there, slightly outboard. But don't really see that on this model, nor do we really see any gearbox detailing, no gearbox casing, nothing like that. We've just got this chunk of plastic down there. But we do have the rear suspension. There it is, the double wishbone pushrod geometry back there, and of course the really nice and very large rear tires, big slicks, lots of mechanical grip on this car. High speeds you'd get pretty decent aero grip, but again, at the lower speed and medium speed stuff, it was all about mechanical grip in this era, and this car certainly had it in abundance. Just taking another look down the side here, you can get a better sense of the overall proportions. You can see that the car itself is pretty stout. We're not talking about anything really long. I don't know the, uh, the actual uh, dimensions on this thing, but it certainly was not 8 meters or whatever the Mercedes nowadays is. Of course, uh, there was refueling in this era, so they would have at most maybe 100 liters on board, probably less than that. So two, three stops over typical Grand Prix distance meant that the cars were a lot lighter. 600 kilograms, I believe, was the formula weight in 1996. So again, lots more freedom to play in this era in terms of how you wanted to configure everything. And ultimately, um, this era of Formula One design is the one that I enjoy the most. The cars look absolutely fantastic. The racing was good, they sounded great, the drivers were fantastic up and down the grid, and we had a great variety of teams too. 1996, we still had the 40 team, I believe we still had the 40 team in 1996 for a handful of races. Um, we had, of course, Jordan, we had Ligier winning a race in 1996, Ferrari, even though they were really off form in 96, they won three races that year. So. It was a great era for F1. Eventually we would see talents like Heinz Harald Frensen and Eddie Irvine come to the fore. Um, Michael Schumacher really starting to get on song toward the end of the 90s. Probably would have won 1999 if he didn't have his broken leg at Silverstone. Mika Hakkinen winning back-to-back -back championships on the trot. So the 90s really were a golden age of Grand Prix racing. I think when they went to the groove tires, it really spiced things up. The drivers could chase the cars around a little bit more in the low and medium speed corners. It was great fun to watch, great lines, great geometry, great soundtrack, pretty much the perfect idea of what I, at, at any rate, think a racing series really should be. Taking the camera up freehand now to get a little bit closer in on some of the details on this car. Let's take a look at the cockpit first and foremost. There is Damon Hill sitting in there, and uh, yeah, it looks somewhat similar to what we see today, but you can also see that there are some key differences. Look at how much narrower the cockpits were in this era. The drivers don't have as much space. Also, take a look at the cockpit sides there. You can see the shut line around this horseshoe-shaped device, which is really the headrest. It's not integral to the structure of the car. You take that out, and the sides of the monocoque are very thin. That is something that's very different nowadays. You can see how uh, the side pods come in. They basically start to widen out only when they get behind the driver. So the side pods there are not really offering anything in the way of uh, lateral protection in the event of an impact. Nowadays we see the cockpit sort of nestled in between the side pods, which uh, of course goes a great way in keeping the driver safe. Steering wheel as well. Uh, you see it looks very similar to, well, the steering wheel that maybe some of you have for your sim racing rigs. Yeah, it doesn't 
quite look like something that you'd see in a road car, but it doesn't look entirely alien. Nowadays, the drivers basically have PSPs in the cockpit with uh, screens and everything. These days, no, they were still more or less just typical steering wheels. You can see some buttons on there. Of course, they would have had buttons for the gearbox, so neutral, reverse, things like that. A radio button for the pits, and a couple of switches maybe for uh, the ignition, as well as cycling through different settings on the car, but for the most part, it was a steering wheel. Of course, this uh, car was semi-automatic, so they would have had paddles on the steering wheel, up on the right, down on the left, or some combination of the two, depending on what the driver wanted, but there it was. No screens, no real rotary switches on these wheels. Some drivers had them uh, simply because that was their preference, but uh, nothing really apparent here. Maybe there's one down there at the bottom, but yeah, that's what they were, and uh, that's how they worked. Everything was just fine with that. Along the sides there, it's a little bit difficult to get the angles, but you can see that there is an attempt at a dashboard. We do have some switches and buttons on there, and it all looks great. This car would have had uh, a rudimentary LCD in there, but uh, again, they don't appear to have modeled that. Along the sides of the cockpit, do we have any detail inside? It uh, doesn't really appear to be so. Can't really get the light in there, but I don't really see anything. We do have uh, some reasonable detail, though. On the driver's suit, uh, there he is. We've got the helmet, and then the personal sponsors on the helmet as well as on the suit itself. Some attempt at seat belts in there. It's just a, a decal, but it's in there, and uh, again, looks all right. The steering wheel is quite tight in with his hands there, just little cutouts there, uh, so it really looks like he's grabbing onto that steering wheel, and uh, indeed he would be. At the back there, do we have any attempt at replicating paddles or anything? I don't think so. It's hard to tell with the way the shadows are falling, but I don't think so. Um, the steering, however, does work on this car, so there we go. And you hear that working there. Very smooth, lots of, actually lots of movement there you can see. Uh, as I'm moving the left front wheel there you can see just how much the steering does actually deflect. And uh, yeah, if you really want to, you can poke your finger in there and uh, you can uh, actually start to steer the car with uh, your finger if you really want to. But uh, yeah, unless you're weird like me, you're not going to care very much at all about that detail. Also along the top side, nice sponsorship stuff. Obviously, the number five, Williams logo, the silhouette of the Rothmans logo, Elf, Renault, Magnetti Marelli, and then, of course, you've got Dill on there. Yes, of course, Damon Hill, the driver's name. Very cool. Moving back the cockpit like we saw. And then up top, there's the Union Jack, Hill, Renault, Elf, and the Elf logo, the emergency kill switch for the Marshalls, and then Renault, the Rothmans barcoding. And that continues through the rear, number five on those little winglets that we talked about earlier. And then the rear wing end fences, just with Goodyear and Elf along the back side of the wing. There you go. Rothman's pseudo decals there. And then the rear, as we looked at earlier. All in all, it is a very, very cool car. And uh, I've got to say, Mini Champs, once again, you have done yourselves a resplendent job. So, that's about all we've got here on the FW18. It is definitely a very nice model. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any opening features, but the steering does work, and the livery has been reproduced nicely, and generally all the shapes and positions and relative sizes of everything have been reproduced very nicely by Mini Champs. It's a decent one. I managed to find this one on eBay at a much reduced price, actually, but still mint in uh, inbox condition, so very nice. Obviously, no defects to speak of on it at all. A couple of cost-saving measures that Mini Champs did manage to do. Uh, you might notice right here as it spins around the fuel nozzle there on the left-hand side of the monocoque. That's just a decal. That's just integrated in with the livery. It's not actually a nozzle. There's no detail in there in terms of a, a separate structure. But... Things like that are relatively minor. I really like the mirrors. They're really minuscule there, but they're in the right place, and they've got the reflective material in there. 
Additionally, the steering, as we take as we took a look at it, looks very nice and it works well, um, very smooth as well, which is interesting and actually quite a bit of steering lock. Perhaps this was the Monaco setup. Front wing there, as you can see, it's very thin, but it's actually quite robust. Uh, don't worry so much about knocking it around if you are considering getting this car. Of course, be sensible with everything, but for the most part, it's nicely put together. It doesn't rattle around. There are no squeaks from the axles. Everything just very nice and very typical of what we would expect nowadays from mini champs and again this being in the world championship winners series i think that we're probably going to see more of these moving ahead again i mentioned that they've also made the mp413 mclaren from 1998 that one is also very nicely put together very comparable to this one as well overall so again mini champs not a bad idea if you are looking for formula one models these are still making them today. The modern cars, 2018 cars, are coming out now, so they look nice. Might have to pick up a couple of those as well. But until next time, I do thank you all very much for joining me on this look at the 1996 FW18 from Williams. Until next time, Ferrari Man 601 saying thanks, and of course, we will see you soon.